Okay, uh, our next speaker is James, who will also be telling us about the use of Daphne for teaching. So, thank you. Some, something like that. Um, we all know that a paper, oh, sorry, a talk is supposed to be an advertisement for a paper. Um, and I guess this talk is actually an advertisement for this paper, which is a couple of years old, but not enough people have read. Um, so, and I had to give a remote presentation, so I thought, why don't I come here and um, wave my arms? Now, I don't want to say I'm here on the basis of false pretenses, but I'm kind of getting close. Um, the experience, this was basically the last thing I did as a professor before my university told me to. Anyway. Um, we can talk about that afterwards in the pub, but I'll need to be quite drunk. Um, and we had this course, SWEN 324, which was actually originally taught by my advisor, Lindsay Groves. Um, if any of you know him. And I sort of inherited it when he left. And the important thing about this course was we have a software engineering degree. We want to put about 120 people through in a software engineering and cybersecurity theme. It's in the middle of the third year of our program. It's a required course. What this means is that if you fail, you either drop out of the software engineering stream into the three-year BSc non-accredited computer science stream, which a lot of people would choose to do and then go off and get jobs, or you, if you are committed to doing the engineering side of things, and I guess in this building, IAT building, we hope you would be, you're going to have to spend another year at university until this course comes around again, or at least this was the way it was, uh, until you're able to pass. Unfortunately, my colleague David Pierce made up a new course, and then, which was a lot easier to teach, and when we both, in fact, left Vic, um, this course was, it was dropped because nobody else wanted to teach it. That's a separate thing. The stuff people have seen there is effectively um, some first-year courses that are common across the engineering program, which have a bit of a basic logic in it. And then second year, there's 261, which is algorithms. And the rest of it is effectively programming. So the way, I, the way we did this, or the way I did this, um, was what I call programming first. And in some sense, it's very similar to what our previous speaker was talking about, but in, in real sense, it's, it's actually the opposite. Because let's face it, nobody, none of our students, we're, I guess, original university. We used to have a great computer science department. Um, it's very focused on programming. And most of the students are afraid of mathematics. Perhaps they've got, had mathematics at first year or logic at first year, or they've been forced to do differential calculus um, in I used, to, I used to make enemies in, in curriculum meetings by saying, yes, I definitely want our students to be able to do algebra and calculus. I want Boolean algebra, and I want lambda calculus. And let's face it, even the people doing our boutique engineering stream that was there effectively as an employment uh, program for people from a physics department, many of whom are still there, um, they were all going to get jobs as programmers anyway. So frankly, learning that kind of stuff would have been more useful than learning traditional um, algebra and differential calculus. These people are programming-centered. And what I realized the underlying theory was, well, look, you know, what does it mean? Well, they're going to be able to write for loops. We know they can write for loops. We know they can write SQL queries. They do that at first year. Um, we know that they're able to write if statements or, or, or matches or cases. Well, intellectually, how is this different from writing quantifiers? How is this different from doing Boolean algebra? You can't be a programmer if you don't understand um, whether it's recursion in Haskell or whether it's a, a for loop or a while loop, or if you can't understand how to build if statements in conditional structures or pattern matches, you can't do it. We know all these students can do it because I've been doing it for two and a half years. Therefore, there shouldn't really be any more intellectual content except you're going to have to learn a new syntax and a, perhaps a new way of thinking about things because you know, you're in this magical world of formal methods. That was basically the approach centered around programming, driven, I guess, like the previous talk, by examples with a lot of iterative and automated feedback, uh, which is one of the things. Uh, the, it, the great thing about automated marking is that the marking is automated. The not so great thing about it, automated marking is that it's not automated, and what it means is not only do you effectively have to mark every single assignment, um, 
before the assignments come in. You actually have to mark every single assignment before you finalize the assignment description. So, uh, because, you know, you've got to be able to write the automated test so that when the assignment goes out, you've got the automated tests ready for when people start working on it. Because, as well as automated testing, you want to have this iterative feedback, and the big advantage of something like Daphne is, you can actually leverage the fact that it will prove things um, in order to get you that sort of feedback um, just with the nature of the fact that it is doing all the, I guess, extended static checking, one could say. Um, we haven't, got, we haven't got onto him yet. And we taught this with a flipped classroom. We taught this in what turned out to be the middle of the pandemic. Uh, and we did get very good results um, in the sense that I think we got the best, not individual teaching evaluations, but the best evaluation for the course that this course, which had been taught at second and, and, and various versions of it, had been taught for something like 20 years. And as far as I could find for the records, we were significantly better. Um, Unfortunately, of the members of the staff, most of them have retired or the PhD students have, you know, gone off and done other things, etc., etc., etc. So in some sense, I'm here on false pretenses. That's all I was planning to say about the course, unless people have other questions. I do have a set of slides, but basically I was, I was going to be somewhat mean about Daphne. <laughs> because, uh, you know, teaching all these people and now doing Daphne myself, um, there is a, a longer version of this talk, which I, I think would make an ex excellent keynote, but of course nobody's going to invite me to keynote Popple about everything I hate about Daphne and Haskell and Rust, uh, having had to learn these three languages in 18 months, uh, which might be why my brain kind of melted when I got COVID. And uh, anyway, I'm uh, yeah, right. So, um, oh, how long have I got? It says I should segue to the final bit in eight minutes. I'll try and go a little bit quicker, because you all know Daphne, right? Um, when I gave the Haskell and Daphne version of this talk, I'll, I'll, I'll comment from um, Jeremy Gibbons said, I was listening along to the, the Daphne version, and I was thinking, good, is it really like that? That's, that's horrible. And then he said, and then James started doing the same thing to Haskell, which I'm not going to do today. Um, and he said, oh, James is just completely wrong, and it's all rubbish. So um, bear that in mind. Here we go. Um, one of the things we say about Daphne is it teaches design by contract. Um, I know that's not the official Daphne logo, but I, it just really, really works for me. Um, Ruskin's got the best hair in the business. We all know that. And he's very enthusiastic. <laughs> This is actually where we start, and I, I, you know, there, is a, there is a method to our madness that is based on more than syntax. Really, um, we've got an add method here, we've got an add function here, and you know, what's going on, and this is actually an example I would give in the class, pretty much the way I'm doing this now, and say, okay, what should happen? Because the, the class was flipped, uh, people had to do exercises before the class, and then I would come through and basically say, okay, what ex where are people up to? In fact, I knew that from our exercise system, so I had ideas about what questions they were going to ask, and the preparation for a lecture mostly involved drinking coffee, um, because I was going to answer any question in real time that people asked, with Daphne live. Um, and frankly, spending a couple of days... Uh, before each lecture to prepare a set of slides would have been less work and less emotional energy, but I don't think people would have learnt as well. And, and one of the nice things about Daphne is because it's got the IDE and stuff, you can get away with that. So, with a few minutes to go, why does one verify? Why doesn't the other one verify? Uh, and you can see we've got the red line. There it is. The assertment might not hold. Why not? Well, the reason is because... The short answer, as uh, perhaps better from I would say, Daphne is designed by contract. And as we heard in the testing talk, Daphne's methods are verified against their specifications, whereas Daphne's functions will be looked through and verified in terms of their implementation. And this is something that students need to learn and need to understand and need to get an idea on what I'm going to call the conceptual model of working with Daphne. And so showing examples like this, this one I fact quite like, um, shows that because the way to fix this is well you have to add in the specifications to the method to the add m here where was the method there it was uh, it doesn't have any specifications so Daphne will will not be able to reason about that at all um, have I really only got three minutes left so there's a bunch of other things which I'm not going to talk about which are which are really amusing um, uh, to do with the fact that 
Daphne has, Daphne is not an expression language like Lisp. It is a statement-oriented language. Uh, and uh, refactoring between the statement-oriented parts and the, um, the expression-oriented parts is fun, to say the least. But that can wait for another. I particularly like this, this situation you can get here, um, which even though I'm programming Daphne and have been for a few years now, I still do on a regular basis if I have to refactor from an expression to a, to a statement or vice versa. So can you pause on that? And it, you, is that because the braces there are used as set building? Yes, that's right. So in, a, in the functional subsyntax, which is kind of how you have to think about it, the curly brackets give you a set. But in the expression, which is which you can see uh, in the first, where are we? You can't you can't see that at all because both of those whoops, where are we? Both of those things are in the function. Both of those things, sorry, are in the functional subset. Um, even though this is a method, the method there at line thirty one, when it comes to the expression, switches into the expression subset. Right. Um, you can also see this is because the. Um, Expression syntax being ripped from Haskell requires a then, or ML, or Pascal, whereas the, um, sorry, it re requires a then, but actually the refactored syntax, where there is the version that doesn't work, doesn't need a, where is it? Do I have one? I don't have it. Doesn't need a then if you're actually in statement land. Why? Well, because C sharp doesn't need a then, because C doesn't need a then, because I don't know. Well, we all know that you know, Born and Co. didn't you like could argue typing that it's much. Because it's different, right? That the expression version should be differentiated from the statement version. Is, that's a good thing. Well, you could argue that, and and people have argued that, and I've had this argument with Ruston at least once, and I'm happy to have it again. Um, <laughs> so. There's a bunch of things like that. Um, this, is an, this is another one, which is, you know, can you have, where can you have, this one actually I think is fine. Um, lots of languages say you can't have a mutable state defined at a module level. Well, that's great, so you have constants defined at the module level, uh, but where it comes unstuck <coughs> is if you try and do this and have those constants inside a method, which you can't have because so, this is more than just syntax, and uh, Sophia's not in the room, but I did this diagram especially for her, so if you see her, tell her that James did a diagram for her. This is what I would like to teach people about from the terms of the semantic model, and I've even used Greek symbols here, so we've got some states, and these states are kind of collections of effectively propositions or facts, and you know we can have pi, which are the um, predicates, which are confined within a particular state and tell you something, some information about it, and you have functions that come out of a state and also define some information about it. That's fine, that's half the story. And then that, that effectively gives you this expression language, and then on top of that, you can transition between the states and you do that with a semicolon. Or, for the Haskell people, you could call it a monad. I don't actually know what a monad is, but I'm told that that's what it does. So, you can believe that or not. Anyway, there it is, and in, in, in uh, Daphne, that, that monad is represented by the semicolon, which gets you from one imperative state to another imperative state. And that's important because, you know, certain things will change and certain things will be carried on, and you may have to reason about the difference between states and whether things are unchanged or not, etc., etc., etc. Come to my half-hour-long talk on Friday, at, or Saturday, sorry, at WITS. Uh, if you want to go into that in some horrible detail. Okay, that's the model. I was then faced with having to explain this. So the good thing is, right, here this function, that's easy to explain. It's a function. Why doesn't a function end with a semicolon? Um, Pascal was generally thought bad for having semicolons as separators, not terminators, but in any C format language, you would have to put a semicolon there to terminate the thing, but in Daphne, it's a mistake if you do, the same actually as in Rust, because you've got to let the value out. But the story I've told about states and monads and semicolons is perfect, because it says, well, of course, you shouldn't have a semicolon in there, because there's no state transition. You're in the same state, it just comes straight out, that's fine. And then here, we are doing something imperatively Something similar, but imperatively, and you know, we've got a semicolon for our assignment, and we've got a semicolon, oh sorry, a, a colon equals for assignment, and we've got a couple of semicolons as we move along between the various states. That's all fine. Okay, now please explain to a room of quite clever 19 and 20 year olds what the hell is going on in the last line. <coughs> right, it's a function, but we're declaring a variable. 
which we can change, except we can't change. You can't assign into that variable. Um, and we're using a semicolon, even though we're actually defining a value. Uh, sorry, we're a, 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 semi, a colon equals, even though we're defining a value. And then we've got a semicolon. Uh, and this is where I say my only effective teaching strategy was to sort of move from uh, I don't know, um, pedagogy to apology, or frankly at this point, phrenology. Um, in fact, you can explain this in terms of the, um, the evolution uh, of the Daphne programming language. But it's like, why didn't you just pick let an in? Sorry. I don't quite understand that because you're saying you're not complaining about syntax. But that was just a, compl a complaint about syntax. So, like, I, I'm, I'm in trouble understanding the. Well, it's not. I, I'm arguing it's not just a complaint about syntax, because what I've what I've tried to build up an argument is we have a conceptual model. That conceptual model is tied to the language syntax, which is the way I tend to teach. And then here, um, we kind of have to break that and say, well, that semicolon there, it's sort of syntactically the same, but it certainly isn't an operation that changes state. And that use of the keyword var isn't allocating a variable. In fact, it's doing exactly the same as the keyword const does in other contexts, Just but you're not allowed to use it. Would you be slightly happier? Yes, I would be quite a lot happier. Or const, or con, or let. Um, the point is, I guess, this is, this is why this is nice. This, is, this, I think, is really good, and I think it's really great that um, the Daphne team sorted out this horrible mess. Uh, which they did at 4.0, because you can actually explain what the hell is going on. If it's used in the proof, only it's ghost, otherwise it's normal. And you know, <coughs> just trying to explain the difference that I have managed to explain already between the, the functional um, stateless world and the imperative world, which uses methods, is kind of screwed up when you've got function methods and predicate methods. Because people, you know, people would have, in a class this big would sit and say, well, is it a function or is it a method? Which world is it in? I am a member of Working Group 2.16, the most recent and the least famous IEEE working groups on programming languages. And, you know, we do like our syntax. But for better or for worse, the syntax is the user interface of programming language. I think the conceptual models are important, and I keep finding this myself with working with Daphne, is you have to kind of understand about how Daphne wants you to think about a program in order to be able to get this done. And again, this links into syntax because I think if we're trying to teach people these languages, we actually have to teach at the conceptual model level. And you know, you can go into um, the old Fred Brooks argument about the essential difficulties of doing something, like can I manage to express the proof versus the accidental difficulties of doing something. And the trick, to quote Douglas Adams, is you don't want to get in a situation where you get so happy about resolving <laughs> the um, accidental details that you miss out the point that you haven't really managed to attack the essentials. Um, Fred Brooks talks about language complexity budgets. Uh, in the um, Mythical Man Month, in his later book on language design, he talks about having an ideal programmer or an ideal customer for the system. And I think as Daphne carries on, um, having a good model of that will also help guide decisions about, you know, well, effectively how to spend your complexity budget, how complex do we want to, do we or the, the team want to make the language, et cetera, et cetera. <sighs> Sorry, I'm over time, but started late. Thank you.